and welcome to Road to the KO, the weekly show where we talk all things knockout. We've been so overwhelmed by the level of support we received after our first show with Dino and Cody and talking with Lisa of the Knockout Committee. So thank you all for your support and keep sharing it out, keep pumping it out through Facebook, watching it on YouTube and also through SBS On Demand. Uh, this week's show, we're going to be having a chat with one of uh, Rugby League's best, one of the finest blackfellas to come out of Wiradjuri country. He's dominated the bush footy scene for so many years and started back 22 years ago playing his first knockout in Sydney in 1994. It's Naranda's own Jeffrey Choco Johnson. How are you, brother? I'm good, brother. How are you? Welcome to the show, eh? Road Thank to the you. KO. Thanks for the invite. I'm glad to be here. I think, um, you know, what you've done here with the Road to the KO, it's important. It's important to all our mob. And, you know, I think it's going to be great. We're going to have a bit of fun talking to Choco about his uh, deadly career and why he got involved in playing rugby league and the knockout itself. But more importantly, this man's got some things to say passionately about some of the, the laws and the rules around how the knockouts govern uh, and some of the things that he would like uh, really looked at, which is uh, great to see. Plus, we're going to have uh, a couple of packages tonight. One on my very own beloved LaPerouz Panthers. Uh, looking forward to how they're gearing up and preparing for this year's KO. And plus, we talked to Shane Nolan Carr on that incredible kick to tie it up in last year's men's grand final. But first up, talking to uh, Choco, Jeffrey Johnson. Brother, the knockout, I mentioned 94 was your first ever knockout. Why, did you, why were you so passionate about playing in the knockout? Look, I think um, just watching my brothers play, um, I went to my first knockout in 91, which um, I was only a 13-year-old boy. And, um, you know, seeing my brothers and my cousins play together, it was, you know, something special um what they took in to every game and how they approached it and you know the, the kinship that they had going into them games it was it was i felt it as a young boy so you know getting to play in uh 94 was you know something special i i played come on i was 16 and um you know i got to play with the likes of cliff Lyons, and you know that was something special because you know i was only a young fella and seeing him play on tv it was mm. It was very special for me to be able to go on and, and you know, run on with a, a superstar like Cliffy. Well, you became one of the best halves to come out of that region and playing with uh, Cliff Lyons, one of the greatest ever, possibly my favourite all-time State of Origin player, certainly for the Quarries. And what did you, what did, actually did you learn from him? Because you become the senior leader now in that area. What did you learn from Cliffy? Look, uh, you know, I think that playing footy and playing your best footy and, um, you know, I look for myself. It's always been about you know doing the best for my teammate. And look, I, I um, you know, I think I was I was just in awe of playing with Cliffy and the likes of Cliff and uh, Frank Stokes, who actually played with us that year. So, you know, it was. I suppose I went from playing in the knockout, you know, the following year that I went. I just grew from that that experience. And look, I um, you know, I couldn't couldn't have started in a better fashion. You've come from a, a big region, as I mentioned, and Narend was fairly small place, so it's hard to get the same team year in, year out to play at a knockout. So who are some of the teams that you've played for over the years? <clears throat> over the years, I've played with um, Griffith Freeways. Um, I've played with Ewan Monaro, played with um, Cesspat and Ron Merritt Memorial Team. Um, I was lucky enough to win four knockouts with them. So, you know, one of those knockouts are hard to come by, but that was pretty special to be able to do so and, in, in, you know, win four in a row. So something that I can take away, um, you know, you know, I'm not sure whether that feat will be repeated because it's, you know, to win four four knockouts in a row, it's pretty special. Oh, it's ridiculous, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and I, know, I remember La Perouse Community was on the, the back end of a few defeats through that process yes. in the semi-finals, Lee did. Yeah, we did knock La Perouse out a few times, but <laughs> sorry, you swallows. <laughs> um, they're over it by now, hopefully. Um, but that's what I mean, it's an important time. It's, it's The game itself has grown so much over the years. What have you enjoyed in, in terms of how the knockouts grow? Your first one in 94, the first eventual of bidding a knockout was back in 1971, but you've seen such growth in 22 years. What have you enjoyed in changes over those years? Um, I think the professional, you know, for, for professionalism that the game's, you know, come to, I think, um, you know, the the running of the knockout I think's improved. I thought last year's knockout was you know a really really well run knockout. Um, but I think over the years the the services that have been able to engage with the community as well. Um, I think that's been awesome that you know our mobs exposed to you know things like health education. Um, you know and 
you know, looking after themselves. I think that also the growth of the women's league, mm. I think that's been great for the game. Um, you know, we've had, we've been able to have some women exposed on the knockout level, which have then gone on to represent Australia. So I think it's, you know, that's been, uh, you know, a big plus for the knockout. Well, both myself and Juro San have been calling the women's grand finals over the number of, you know, last eight years at the knockout. And, and we have seen the, the increase number of girls participating, the quality of the game that's been playing, and, and now the pathways the representative honours that uh, our girls are getting through the All-Stars game and also through playing in the mainstream New South Wales and Australian competitions. And of course, the Murrays up in Queensland are getting a taste of success up there as well. Yeah. Uh, Road to the KO uh, got out and caught out uh, with the Redfern women's team uh, to check out their semi-final. Um, they went down uh, in that game, missed out on getting into the grand final, but the performances was great. And, and it's that year that sometimes these clubs have to play regular week in, week out football to make them better coming for the knockout. Um, it's the preparation you need, isn't it, leading into that it knockout is, year? That is the preparation you need. And look, for Redfern to be able to play all year together and then go to the knockout, it gives them that edge. You know, you have teams that are sort of pulling together at the knockout, as men, the men's do. But I think that, you know, for a, a women's team to be able to play in, throughout the regular season, it's, it's you know, they're going to be a, a, a force to be reckoned with at the knockout. Mm. It really is important to prepare well for the knockout. And I know that my community of La Perouse has been preparing well for these events since 1971. And Road to the KO got out and checked out the preparation of the La Perouse Panthers. My name is Chris Ingray and I'm the Chief Executive of the La Perouse Aboriginal Land Council. The Land Council is the main supporter for the La Perouse Panthers. Um, we provide financial and administrative support for the whole knockout campaign and our office is usually busy six months out of knockout time. We're organising supporter gear, we support the committee um, with administration and, and, and space for them to meet and our staff are heavily involved in the committee. We do a sponsorship each year um, and we can't put a price on our support um, during the campaign. The knockout time is the only, one of the only times in the whole year, calendar year, that our mob go away united and on the same page. So it's very important for the LARPA Land Council to continually support the Aboriginal knockout year in, year out. I think, is, um, like everyone else, it's, it's an important time. Um, it's important to individuals to represent not just LARPA, but their family at knockout time, like every other player in the whole knockout. My name is John Ryan Hennessy. My position is the front row, also known as a prop. And my name is Logan Lester, and I am 5'8", or halfback. Best part about playing at knockout, representing our communities and... Yeah, it's my third knockout. How many have you played? Five. <laughs> <laughs> We're playing a like up this year, this, oh, it's going to be awesome playing for our club, mob, community and yeah. family. Yeah, all the family is going to be coming out to watch us. Yeah, it's going to be great. Oh, it's going to be heaps good. First knockout. <laughs> yeah, my dad's played in the NRL and played for LAPA, represent his community and um, can't wait to um, follow in his footsteps. And be great this year. Same with me, I've got, oh, I've got heaps of people that play in the NRL who's related to me. Eric Sims, Steve Renov, all oh, just heaps. Oh, found out Greg Bird's my uncle about a month ago. Oh, I've got heaps of family in the blood, got to follow their footsteps. We're the boys from LARPA. And you're on the road to the KO. LA all um, the way, brother. <laughs> Good to see our LARPA whose Panthers are preparing well for the 2016 knockout. And how cute were our little boys there, Logie and Geordie, getting ready for their under-12s matches this year. Uh, La Perouse, as we know, over many of years of the knockout, have been involved in plenty of controversy from the dramas at Raymond Terrace against Moree and also the sit-ins that we've had in over previous years, including the one at Woiwoi against Nulla. Uh, controversy is something, too, that um, has affected Geoffrey Johnson in the past year, where he had to sit out the 2015 knockout due to the judiciary. Uh, Jeffrey, tell us about your story and why you had to miss out last year. Look, I um, I did sit out last year. It was something that was, you know, hit home for me. Um, I think that, you know, the, the the judiciary or the penalty that was handed down to me, I, it sort of it took away from me what some something, something special to me, and that's a knockout. I think um, I believe that, you know, 
the knockout should be separate from country rugby league. I know that yes, they do provide uh, referees and that, and they you know they've got a bit of governance around that. But I think that you know the the judiciary suspend hand the suspension down to me that took something away from me very special that something that I've been doing for the past twenty two years. I think that it, um, you know there is I think the body for the knockout and country rugby league really need to get together and flesh out how they work around it because you know we've got mob out there that you know they play their hearts out through semi-finals even and at the back end of the season that's leading into the knockout so i think that it just needs to be confirmed you know if if a penalty uh, you know a suspension is handed down that how they govern or you know police that in the knockout because we're talking about something that's you know it's the knockouts a cultural event for us um, it's and it affects you know every community that enters the team. So I just believe that it's there has to be a better process with it. Mm. I really do think so. So so just so people know, you were suspended by your country rugby league group last year, uh, prevented you from playing in the knockout because the knockout competitions are supporting those suspensions from various levels of wherever teams are coming from. Whether it's one week or a whole twelve month suspension, you can't play in the knockout because those games. So if you're suspended one week in country rugby league, you come to a knockout. You can't sit out the first game and then play in the second game because it doesn't equate to what they want to say. Basically, the bodies can't allow you to play in the knockout at all. Well, country rugby league's pretty much come out and said if you're suspended, that's it. You can't play in the knockout. I do think it's wrong. I do think that um, you know, if country rugby league are going to have that you know governance over over the knockout, they really need to come in. And if yes, like you're saying that if you know. A, person could get one one week mm. leading into the knockout, that counts them out. Um, there's a count them out for the first game of the knockout and then they, then they can play the rest of the knockout. I don't, you know, that's not being said. Some of the things that have been put to me by other people who maybe have been running around the game in previous years and also um, supporting the game, the knockout generally, is that they're concerned about uh, people who've been suspended playing who then might cause damage to other players or uh, there's no insurance coverage if you're a suspended player. But um, you know that what 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 applies then? What rule applies to the players who aren't registered with country rugby league teams anywhere else who just turn up for the weekend and play football? That's right. So it's an issue, but it's more so. You know, it's basically we're saying is that the governing bodies are now preventing people from taking part in what we have called our modern day corroboree. That's right. Well, we have called it our modern day corroboree, and to me, that's saying that. If that, that's our modern day corroboree, that's like, uh, yes, there's an authority body there saying that you can't go and dance in that corroboree. And this is cultural to us. This is, our, this is the people's knockout. And this is what needs to be fleshed out. And it needs to, then it has to be, a, a, you know, it has to be clear whether or not, yes, they, yes, a player might get suspended, but then they go and get, they, they can serve that suspension in the, the next regular season. The knockout needs to be ours. And I think that, you know, that needs to be somehow wavered. No one goes out intentionally to hurt someone, but this happens. But this knockout's important to each and every one of our, us mob, and I think that we need to, there needs to be something clear on it. The, the, the frightening thing too is that if you cop a one week suspension, accidentally hurting someone or you know loose tackle, it happens all the time in the NRL, and you miss a week, yet you've been preparing and waiting all year to play with your son or your nephew, or, or you're a player who's been wanting to, your dad's hanging in there so you can actually play, you know, with your dad. Then they're, they're robbing people of that opportunity to play in those games for, for a one week suspension. And there's no support there for that country rugby league or the other bodies to come in and say to that player, right, okay, you got a one week suspension, you'll see, we equate that to one game at the knockout or two games at the knockout. Once you've done that, then you can play. Because clubs then have to make the decision, if they go into that rule, then they know, all right, Choco's gonna miss one or two games, do we carry him as our 25th player and not have him take part in those first two games? Do we play short as 24 squad? Because as you know, you need 25 to win a knockout. And if you're willing to take that risk on that player, then they should be able to come in. But but I think what you're trying to say is just wave it. Wave just, it. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about those wave suspensions. It. At the end of the day, the player is going to serve his sentence the, next, the following year. Like I said, it could be a player just... They, has to sit out one week. If that's you know taking him out of the whole knockout, mm. that's just it's, it's too much. It's too much for us. 
the knockout's important to us. We, we wait all year. We condition ourselves all year to play in the knockout. We get together. We play in our, the smaller knockouts to prepare ourselves for this big knockout. So, you know, I th really think that it needs to be looked at and it has to be, there has to be a common ground on it because it, it's hurting too many community. Um, and like I said, no one's going out there to hurt someone. They're just going out there playing tough football, whether they're playing semi-final football, playing black soft, blackfella style football, as we do. We like to go out there and play rough and tough. But the thing is, no one's intentionally trying to hurt someone. The thing is, we just need to be able to play in our cultural event. It's important to us. It always has been and always will be. And it's supposed to be the people's knockout. So that's, that's what I think. Oh, good to see you fire, brother. And, um... Unfortunately, you had to miss out on last year's knockout because of it. One thing I have seen over the last few years, I've been mean, calling for eight years now at the knockout, is the quality of refereeing has improved under the NRL structure. We get we had Chris James, an NRL referee, do the grand final last year, and I thought the quality was great with that. Um, we've got a judiciary that's there. We've got Mal Cochran, one of our deadly brothers from, from Tari, who's also part of the NRL judiciary system. So they're, they're on the ground. and. Yeah. I guess the other thing coming out of that is if you do get suspended out of a knockout, does that then count against you when you go back to your group competition or your other area? So pl plenty more for us uh, to look at. But as uh, Choco said, as Jeffrey Johnson said, I think it's important that uh, whoever is running the event uh, in the future needs to sit down with the NRL, the Country Rugby League and all the various different groups and sort this judiciary issue out because it's preventing people from taking part on their cultural event, the modern day corroboree that we call the Koori Knockout. Uh, we caught up very recently at Road to the KO. We went out on the streets again, on the road, and we caught up with uh, two fellas who took part in last year's grand final winning team for the Redfern All Blacks. Their regular season captain, Stevie Winters, and the man who stopped it all, Shane Nolan Carr, who kicked that winning goal to take us into Golden Point extra time. Here's the kick for Nolan. He comes in and strikes it. He's got enough on it. It's going to the post. It's gone over. Can you believe it? They've sent it into goal. My name is Shane Nolan Carr, play for the Redfern All Blacks, starting halfback. The knockout means coming together to play for my community, Redfern All Blacks, where I grew up and my family grew up. Yeah, it was the greatest feeling in the world to win a knockout at a young age. Always dreamed of kicking and winning the goal to win the knockout. Got the, got the chance to do that, but the pressure was on. And I was really nervous when I was doing it. Looking around and see where my cousin Mark was, so he could kick the goal. He wasn't on the field, so I just took it, ate, ate all the pressure up, and yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Stephen Winters, and I play for Ref and All Blacks. Uh, Shane's kick at the end, oh, to be honest, I had no, <laughs> had no confidence in him. He, he missed it a few years ago. Uh, the year before, he missed it 50 metres out, down in Wollongong, in the Wollongong knockout. But I was going from the back of my mind, I knew he was going through his mind as well, but there was, I think, there was a lot of doubt that he was going to make it because there was a good few heaps of boys on the on the field that had, I think had great kicking abilities. So, but he was the youngest out there, so he he's, he just stepped up and he said, "Stuff to give me the ball, I'll kick it." And look what he did now. He brought it back to Redfern after that kick. Didn't want to miss it. Didn't, if I missed it, I wasn't going to walk around Redfern for a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, then my cousin Fox, Josh had a car, just said to me, "No matter, cause if you miss it." We all still love you and all that. That's what made my nerves go away. I was just hoping for the best, hope it went over. <laughs> so when it went straight, I was just, yeah, jumped in the air. Just knew it was, we're going to extra time. It's the best feeling in the world, knowing that I, I was a part of winning a knockout at a young age, uh, doing what I did to win the knockout for us, bring it back home. The fact of um, all of us boys play, there's a few boys played in the NRL, and they come back and play for um, thing, play alongside the boys in the um, thing knockout. It means a lot seeing them come back, and also doing it for like the family and friends that come all over the New South Wales to say shout out. They're all from Redfern and show me how proud they are um, thing of us, and show me how proud of, we are of them coming to support us. Uh, what people can expect from us from uh, 2016. Well, just wait and see. I guess Redfern all backs, we come out with a surprise like we do all, every year. Look out, your mob Redfern's going back to back. What about that kick? from Shane Nolan Carr to take it into Golden Point extra time. They'll be talking about that kick for the next 46 years of the Koori knockout. Incredible stuff, and uh, didn't he handle the pressure? Choco, he was the youngest player in the Redfin team. And he, and he, and he, and he nailed it over, 19 year old. He nailed it like he was the most experienced player there, didn't he? <laughs> awesome stuff, and what a finish to a game. Yeah, he put it over, and uh, 
Stevie Winners didn't have much confidence in him kicking that goal, but uh, he certainly uh, put his team, and they went on obviously to win it in goal and put extra time to that deadly try to Jonathan Wright. Uh, the, the pressures of uh, rugby league and knockouts, we mentioned 25 players to win knockouts and you've won four in a row. That, the pressure situation that players find themselves under because they're representing community, they're representing families, they're representing the players around them. People are placing a, a great deal of pressure on them. There's a lot, a lot at stake. There is a lot at stake. You know, you don't want to be that person that you know misses a tackle that for someone to score a try, and you play, you play with your heart on your sleeve. And you know, when it comes down to the dying moments of a game, you don't want to be that player that sort of, if it is tight, you don't want to be that player that you know, misses a tackle that could cause an upset, and you lose, you're out of the knockout because you take that away from you, and it's like, it's devastating for you if you are the person. You know, it's not the first time that a player's had a chance to kick a goal at the end of a game to win it. In 2009 at Armadale, Chris Sando was playing halfback for Minda River and it was 44 all at full time and he had a chance to kick a goal. He got a penalty 30 in front and he hit the top of the left upright and it waved away at the end of full time. Took it in extra time and Walgott won it in second half extra time. Similar fashion to Redfern, they scored a try to Sean Daylight in the corner. Incredible. So a player of his standard played in NRL. Yeah. Uh, couldn't finish the job, but a, a youngster like Shane Nolan Carr took it in the Golden Point extra time. Incredible. incredible. We talked about the um, the judiciary before, a controversial issue, but something there where things have really improved is around the care of players in terms of the medical and having plenty around to support. We've got a great medical team. The NRL provides people. You know, I've had um, Professor Nairi Brown, a deadly Indigenous in doctor on the uh, Indigenous doctor on the ground, to look after the people and. And, and look, you know, make sure that everyone's fit, they're prepared for their games. Uh, we've had tragedies in the past where we've lost players at events. So um, you've seen that development over the years and it's incredible, isn't it? It has come a long way. You know, back in the day, the, the medical staff may not have been at the games like the, the way they are now. Their presence is there. Um, and, you know, even having medical tents where players can go back with their injury, get their injuries treated straight away, um, you know, it's the past few years it's been second to none you know mm -hmm. one at one at Raymond Terrace there the, um you know there was a tent where the, we had uni students there you know doing rub downs for for teams and any mm -hmm. or any team that wanted to come along and get an injury treated and you got to be prepared don't you nutrition's important players need to look after themselves plenty of water the right food and over the weekend making sure none of your mob are getting going on the side and taking off to the pubs and clubs at night because it takes a you know, a, a clear, healthy body over the weekend to win those events. It does. You know, you know. I know a lot of the teams put a, um, you know, a curfew on most of the players not to be going out. A ban, a ban, no yeah, more. Yeah, that's right. But um, the teams that go there that are serious, they put a, you know, they they do the right thing by themselves, and um, you know, and that's what it takes. You can't have, you know, a weak link in your chain, and and that and that can cause it. You've seen incredible players over the time of playing in 22 years of the knockout. Who are the greatest players that Jeffrey Johnson's seen? You know, I can be biased and say that, you know, I, I, um, my older brothers were an inspiration to me. But um, I suppose as far as attacking players, um, you know, Wes Patton was one of the best that I played with. But I got the likes to see players like when I was younger and see from other teams like Brett Davis and that from up at Nambucca and that. Um, if you want to talk, you know, Ball players and speedsters, I suppose. Wes Patton was, he was, as an attack and play, he was probably one of the best. As an enforcer and in def defence, I'd say Robbie Simpson was probably, I got to play with Robbie and, you know, he was, he really um, was a hard player. Um, you know, through my juniors, I was like playing up from, from 16s and then I got to see Wilfred Williams. So I played under Wilfred through my 16s and, you know, he was a, he was a tough player. But I think through the knockout, from my knockout days, I think Robbie Simpson in defence and Wes Patton. Um, you know, there's players like in every in every community. You got your you, you got your, your ball player. You got your your, your enforcer in defence, and you've got your um, your speedster. So, mm -hmm. in every community, in every knockout team, I think everyone's got their special player in in that area. So I think it's, you know, from all the other different areas. You know, there's all special players everywhere. All us all us mob can play, but I think, you know, when you got someone in a, a, attack and defence, they're the two for me. You mentioned uh, Wilfred Williams, the father of Joey, yeah. who's played plenty of good football at knockout level. He's also part of our NITV team. Uh, I've actually had the fortune of playing with both Wesley and um, Robbie John as well okay. in an under-19 side, uh, sort of a LARPA okay. combined bit of Redfern. Yeah, it was yeah. good. Yeah. Um, 
And Brett Davis has had two mentions already in two weeks of Road to the KO, mentioned by Dean Witters and now mentioned by Jeffrey Johnson. So, hell of a player. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was awesome to watch. You know, and I'm fortunate enough to play with his sons. So, you know, it's... um. Yeah, he was. He stuck out for me when I went to Nambuck and knocked out, and I was seen him play. And um, I actually seen him play down when he was playing for Young, uh, when I was a young fella coming through the 16s, and I mm. used to think, "Who's this bloke here?" And yeah, well, I worked out it was um, Brett. So, yeah, he is a special player. But you know, like I said, in all communities, we've all got our shining stars in the in the community, and people have got you know who they think are the best, and like we we're all deadly players. But we've got some guns out there. And these boys even that are making the NRL, I think, you know, they're our shining stars at the moment and they're leading the way for us. Mm. You missed out last year on playing in the knockout, but it's true that Jeffrey Johnson hasn't settled in a team for 2016. Where are we going to find you? Who are you going to be playing with? Uh, at the moment, I'm just a free agent. But if I just think, um, <laughs> yeah, I've, yeah, I just, I'll retire this year from the regular footy. So I'm, I'm finished there and I... Yeah, I've sort of haven't sort of decided on yeah who I'm going to. Could this run be with. the last year you run around at a knockout? It could be. I've you know I've I've I sort of retiring from football. I um, you know I've got some business opportunities that I'm I'm looking into and um, you know trying to develop. So I've sort of taken my focus away from football, um, and I'll yeah I'll look at what I can do and or commit myself to to my own businesses. So yeah, beautiful. Uh, talking with Jeffrey Johnson, a Narendra boy from down Maradjuri Way, and a, a relative of his also uh, is part of our next story. He's uh, the, uh, an incredible player from my community of La Perouse, but I have Christopher E. Pear Lyons, who uh, unfortunately lost his life playing rugby league at Yarra Oval in 2010. Road to the KO caught up with his young son, Jade Anderson, who's been playing with the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs, and he's looking forward to following up with La Perouse this year at the knockout. My name is uh, Jade Anderson. Uh, I play for La Perouse Panthers, and we are at um, Yarra Bay Oval at La Perouse. Sitting here is my uh, my dad's memorial plug. Um, back in 2010, uh, my dad my dad was playing his first game for the season for the La Perouse Panthers, and um, yeah, he, he collapsed on the field and uh, he, he couldn't be brought back. He had a heart attack, and um, yeah, gr growing up watching him for all those years, uh, I had this dream to hopefully uh, pl play in a knockout for the Light Bruce Panthers with my dad, but um, I was never able to reach that dream. So, yeah, since that day, I, I kind of told myself, you know, like every, every time I put on that Light Bruce jersey and I step on that field, I, most importantly, I was representing my dad. And um, yeah, that, dri that drives me when I step on the field. Um, growing up for all those years, watching, watching the A grade team play, um, I grew up watching the, the likes of Alan Daly and uh, Craig Garvey and um, Chappie, Quint, Quint and Silver, and watching them boys growing up, um, I, get, I get the chance to play with them now, and it, it means a lot to me. Playing under 20s for the, um, the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs this year, it's um, coming back to knock you out, it, it's a whole new level. Um, we have a bit more of the, the Bulldog stuff, it's a bit more structure, but coming to the knock you out, it, it's, you know, it's all based on ability and, and what, what these blackfellas can do and stuff, and it's the best football in the world, and, and you will see nothing like it. Yeah, our um, expectations this year, it's, um, it's pretty high. Uh, we've got a lot of veterans going out, out this year, so um, every year we come close to the grand final and close to winning it, but we never just take it that, that next step. Um, should be good this year. It's over just over about half an hour away from the community, so it should get a lot of, lot of the community out there to support us and, and drive us that one step closer. J.D. Anderson there talking about his old man uh, at the memorial for his dad where he passed away six years ago. We're just so proud of you, bud. You keep playing strong and doing some good footy, and no doubt you'll get the La Perouse boys uh, home. But certainly without uh, not having the old man uh, looking down on you, you'd be very proud of what you're doing with your career and also uh, how you're holding yourself. Uh, Choco, yourself, you know, talking about another Lions boy from Narendra way there in, uh, in Christopher Lyons. He was a pretty incredible player, wasn't he? He was an awesome player, and I know that he would be really proud of Jade, the way he's developed his football as a... As a footballer and as a young man, um, yeah, he spoke really well then, mm. and I thought, think you know, we all love and miss a pair. Um, so yeah, mate, he'd be really, really proud of you. Road to the KO, uh, proud to have Jeffrey Johnson in. Thank you, brother, for coming on our second program, and uh, we really appreciate your passion and your, you know, what the knockout means to you, and 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 I'm sure so many people out there would be really encouraged by what you've had to say. Look, it's been a pleasure and look, I'm so looking forward to the knockout, just like everyone else will be. Um, you know, um, you know what, 
the road to the knockout this year program is going to be great for the build-up for the knockout. And look, I think everyone's in the same boat of, you know, can't wait to get there. Mm. Great to have uh, Choco in, and I look forward to find out who he's going to be playing with too in uh, 2016 at the KO. And just like from all you mob out there, our two shows down now, we want to hear from you. We want to know exactly what it is you'd like us to, to talk about on our program week in, week out. What are the challenging issues that need to be captured here on this program? Uh, and also, we want to hear your fun stories as well. You know, send us your pics, send us your vids, and uh, let us know what it's like on your road to the KO. We'll see you next week. Team Uggs is a world's first team supporter designed Ugg boot. Buy a pair of Team Ugg slippers this Father's Day and put a smile on the old fella's dial. Teamuggs.com.au is where you'll find them. Or check them out on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Team Uggs is a proud supporter of Road to the KO. Thank you.